Good morning, Sable Church, and welcome back for our October 10th online service. If this is the first time that you're joining with us, welcome. It's so great to have you here. My name is Jenna Holly, and I'm the children's director. But whether you're young or not so young anymore, I'm excited to be worshiping along with you this morning. And as we get started, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. Today is a day that we set aside to give thanks, to express our gratitude for God's many blessings. One of the songs that we often sing during our children's program, and is therefore often rolling around in my head, is a song called, I Want to Be Thankful. It goes on to say, I want to be thankful. I want to be grateful. I want to remember everything that the Lord has done. And even amidst the difficult days that we find ourselves in, let's choose to be people who are thankful who are grateful, and not only for the things and the people that we cherish in our lives, but for all that God has done for us. Let's be thankful for His faithfulness. So today we're launching into week four of our Reset series. This is a reminder for those of you who've been following along with us in the small group experience on Sunday afternoons. We are not going to be meeting this week to allow you to celebrate Thanksgiving with your family. but. We are excited to be back with you again on October 17th. Before we welcome our worship team though, here are a few of our weekly updates. We called you to be generous last Sunday as we rallied around the chapel family and you definitely stepped up. Kim heads out today to travel for a specialized back operation and we're pleased to be able to provide them with more than $11,000 towards this costly medical procedure. They are so appreciative of your sacrificial giving and we hope to see Kim return and recover quickly. Would you guys please consider to continue to pray for her as she travels and as she begins the healing process. We have exciting news that this past Monday, Robin and Jen Hoffer welcomed their little girl, Heidi Celine Hoffer, into the world. She had an unexpected early arrival weighing only two pounds, seven ounces, so they will be remaining in London Hospital for the time being. They're all doing well though and are wanting to thank you for all your prayers and so would you also continue to pray for the Hoffer family. We are also very happy to announce a baby shower for Brian and Kara Palmer and baby Eloise as they've come home this week after almost two months in the hospital. Thank you to those who shared meals with them, who've prayed for them and who have come alongside them in this difficult time. The shower will be held at the church on Sunday, October 24th from 2 to 4 p.m. All ladies are welcome, but we ask that you register at sobblechurch.ca slash events. We are pleased to announce that beginning Sunday, October 17th, our new library will once again be open each week between services or throughout the week by appointment. All of our materials have been gone through to make sure that we have a good selection of books that you can sign out. If you'd like to help in our library or would like more information on how to use it, talk to one of the library team beginning next Sunday between the services or contact the church office. Oftentimes, we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness, His provision, and His blessings. We too often forget all that He's done. This can cause us to get discouraged, to lose sight of His goodness, and instead of being thankful, we become bitter. So maybe you need to be reminded of His goodness today. Maybe you need to hear His truth spoken over you. So if you're able, I would encourage you to close your eyes and take time to listen to some of the things that we can be thankful for. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven, who knew you and chose you before the world began, who loves you so much that he calls you his own children, who has brought you from darkness into light and filled you with his glorious power, who has prepared an inheritance for you that will never spoil or fade, who encourages and strengthens you in every good deed and word, who comforts you in your troubles so that you can comfort others. This is our God, 
the ultimate source of all things and the one for whom we live. Let's worship God together. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great
made the lame to walk again, caused the blind to see. Then I cried, dear Jesus, heal my broken spirit, and I will help be the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. He has built for me in glory And I heard about the streets of gold Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change One thing remains out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love on and on and never gives up, 
never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. Oh, oh. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out. And old things have passed away Your love has stayed the same Your constant grace remains The cornerstone Things that we
affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus, our affection, our devotion. Years ago, I was taught a very simple question to ask when reading through the New Testament, like reading parts in the New Testament where, like for instance, you'll read about the early church in Jerusalem that we're talking about in this series, and you'll see that church take uh, some actions or make a decision. So when you're reading about those actions or reading about those decisions to learn to ask the question, is that prescriptive or is it descriptive, prescriptive or descriptive? Is it prescriptive in the sense that it's for me here and now, or is it merely descriptive, those actions that I'm reading about and those decisions that I'm reading about being made, was that merely descriptive of them, kind of a there and then thing, or prescriptive for me, is it also a here and now thing? Prescriptive or merely descriptive. Uh, just to get the hang of this a little bit, let's, let's practice, and you can do that right from where you are at home or at your cottage or wherever you are. Let's practice by using this passage of scripture that we're working our way through in this Reset series. This is Reset. It's a six-part series where we're uh, talking about recapturing the creative simplicity of the early church. We're walking through Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And in those verses, we're identifying six things that the early church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to. So let's just do a little bit of practice on this prescriptive, descriptive thing with our passage. So look at verse 42. And um, 
we, we notice, first of all, that the early church in Jerusalem was devoted to the apostles' teaching about Jesus. That apostles' teaching, as we've said, is not referring to the New Testament. It wasn't written yet. So this is the apostles' teaching about Jesus, including the very words of Jesus. So this early church in Jerusalem was devoted to taking seriously the words of Jesus. Is that prescriptive or descriptive? Is it prescriptive for us? Is it a here and now thing for us? Or was that merely descriptive of the Jerusalem church? Well, I think we'd come to the conclusion that that is prescriptive for us. A devotion to taking seriously the words of Jesus is prescriptive for us particularly when you think about things that Jesus said, um, such as, if you love me, keep my commandments. Or if you think about what Jesus said uh, in what we call the Great Commission, just before he ascends back to the Father, he gives us final marching orders to the church. And he says, I want you to know that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as you go into all the world, make disciples from every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then he says, and teach them to do everything that I've said. So I think, yeah, the Taking seriously the words of Jesus is prescriptive for us, not merely descriptive of the Jerusalem church. Well, think about the next thing in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that this early church devoted themselves to. It was to the fellowship, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. They were devoted, devoted to the koinonia, to their commonality in Jesus, to their connectedness in Jesus. And so is that prescriptive or descriptive. Well, I think we'd have to conclude that that's prescriptive for us. We are as well to be devoted to our connectedness in Jesus as brothers and sisters together as part of the family of God. You think about uh, things that you read in the New Testament, like the author of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 25 says, don't forsake don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. Don't, don't neglect coming together as brothers and sisters in, in Jesus to encourage one another. And that's just one one another in the New Testament. There's 59 of them. When we come together to love one another, to care for one another, to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to uh, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and, and so on. So I, I think we would have to look at this thing of fellowship, of being devoted to our connectedness together in Jesus as something prescriptive, not merely descriptive of the Jerusalem church or any first century church. Well, uh, what, was, what was part three? We did it last week. We noted the devotion to prayer of this early church in Jerusalem devoted to prayer while prescriptive or descriptive. Again, I think we'd have to say prescriptive for us, not merely descriptive of them, but prescriptive for us to be devoted to prayer. Think about, um, you, you, you read in the New Testament, pray continuously, that's pretty clear. Think about the words of Jesus when he said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Think about the words of Paul when he said, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. So I think we would see this thing of prayer uh, sounding pretty prescriptive uh, for us. So the first three things that we've looked at of these six, uh, prescriptive, prescriptive, prescriptive. What about, a uh, little spoiler alert, what about weeks five and six? So next week and then the week after, which will finish off this mini-series. Well, next week, we're going to talk about the devotion of this early church to uh, worship. Well, prescriptive or descriptive? Again, I think we'd have to say that's prescriptive for us for a whole bunch of reasons. And then week six, which will be uh, two weeks down the road, uh, we're going to talk about this early church and their devotion to evangelism, to telling the good news story of Jesus. Again, prescriptive or descriptive, I think we'd have to conclude that that's prescriptive for us and not merely descriptive of them. Well, what about today? This is part four. What's part four about? Well, let me direct your attention to Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. We read all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Prescriptive 
or descriptive. Why is it that as I read those verses, I so desperately want them to be descriptive? Is it because I love my stuff so much and I don't want to get rid of my stuff to share with others? Why is it that I so desperately want this one thing in the midst of all these prescriptive things? Why do I want this one thing in the middle to be descriptive? To see their sharing and their selling of possessions to give to anybody in need as just being about them there and then and not about me, not a here and now thing. Is it prescriptive? What do you think? If it is prescriptive, then man, we better get radical. Or is it just good Bible methodology, good Bible study methodology, like good hermeneutics, just to see this as merely descriptive of them, kind of a there and then thing, but not prescriptive, not for me, not a here and now thing. Maybe that's just good Bible study methods. Well, I'm going to give you what I think is the answer in a few minutes. Uh, but first, let me, uh, let me just say that for years, centuries really, uh, different groups of Jesus followers have wrestled with these two verses of Scripture. In fact, if you went all the way back to the 1500s, back to the, um, to the Radical Reformation, which was on the heels of the Great Reformation, the Radical Reformation was really kind of the, the, the catalyst, the launching point of the, of the Anabaptist movement. And out of that Radical Reformation, there was a group, for instance, called the Hutterites, the Hutterite Brethren, and uh, they sought to uh, practice and continue to seek to practice today um, communal living, uh, to share things together in common, uh, to pool their resources, because they see verses 44 and 45 as prescriptive. In fact, in um, the Western provinces of Canada today, there are about 370 Hutterite colonies uh, practicing as best they can, verses 44 and 45, uh, as something prescriptive for Jesus followers. Now, if you go back again to the Radical Reformation, um, there's another group called the Mennonites, which share a very uh, similar uh, launching point in an Anabaptist sense uh, to the Hutterites. Well, the Mennonites, um, they hearken back to the Radical Reformation as well, another Anabaptist group. And uh, their uh, kind of founder, uh, I guess you would say, was a former Catholic priest who, interestingly enough, became a Catholic priest having never read the Bible. And uh, this particular Catholic priest, who would become a former Catholic priest in about 1535, was really wrestling with some of the doctrines of the church. And um, he would eventually give himself to Jesus, to becoming a follower of Jesus, and would very seriously um, determined to follow Jesus. This person's name was Menno Simons, former Catholic priest who became really the, the leader of the Mennonite movement, um, an Anabaptist movement. And Menno Simons would later participate in, um, in, in communal living, in something that they referred to as the Jerusalem experiment. But later on, Menno Simons would come to the conclusion that that uh, chapter two, verses 44 and 45, describing this Jerusalem church was not something that was universal and it wasn't something that was um, permanent. And so at some point in that Jerusalem experiment of communal living, he decided, you know what? I don't think we've got this right. I, I think verses 44 and 45 are merely descriptive of the Jerusalem church and not prescriptive for us today. But interestingly enough, you've got these two um, Anabaptist groups, both hearkening back to the Radical Reformation, both describing themselves as, as uh, theologians of an Anabaptist persuasion, one group still today following verses 44 and 45 as prescriptive, another group describing those verses as descriptive. Now, keep in mind that 
Jesus has in times past and may still uh, today call some people to um, voluntary poverty. Like think of the story of the rich young ruler. Jesus says to this guy, go and sell everything you've got, give it all away to the poor, and then, um, and then come back and follow me. It's like Jesus knew with this guy that money was going to be a, a problem. It was going to be an obstacle, a stumbling block. So go and, um, and uh, sell everything, give it to the poor, come back and follow me. And, and, and there may still be people to whom Jesus extends a call to voluntary poverty even today. Like if you read, there's a, a missionary by the name of C.T. Studd, or there, there was a missionary, I should say, by the name of C.T. Studd. He was a great um, cricket player, was very wealthy, came from a very wealthy family, and uh, was called by God into missions. And um, he would go to China to serve with Hudson Taylor and uh, would later go to uh, India, to Sudan, to um, the Belgian Congo. He would actually begin a mission agency that still exists today called WEC International. And so this guy, C.T. Studd, although he was um, quite well off and received a very sizable inheritance from his uh, parents, he gave all that away because he felt like Jesus kind of wanted him to start every day from zero. And that's how he determined that Jesus wanted him to walk by faith, to kind of have that zero balance uh, every day. Well, you know, I'm kind of picturing you right now sitting uh, maybe at home on your rather expensive Corinthian leather couch, or maybe you're still kind of stretched out in bed, uh, comfortable bed. Maybe it's one of those expensive beds that, that uh, move up and down and you're in your comfortable home or your comfortable cottage. Maybe you've got a fine Ford automobile in the driveway or in your garage, and you're sitting, lying, wherever, at home, thinking, Higginson, what are you talking about? Very interesting to hear stories about Hutterites and Mennonites and rich young rulers and cricket-playing missionaries, but what are you asking me to do? What are you asking me to do with my stuff? Are you suggesting I need to sell all my stuff? Are you suggesting we should pool all of our resources? Are you suggesting we should have some kind of communal existence? Are you describing some form of Christian communism? Or what, what are you asking me to do with my stuff? Um, that's a great question, by the way. What are we to do with our stuff? What do we do with the accumulation of the things that we have? If we were to put it into the language of Jesus, what are we to do with the abundance of the things that we possess? Now, in reading through the Gospels, and maybe some of you are reading right now John chapter 1 through 7 every day, and certainly in those seven chapters and, and even beyond that, I, I don't think you can find anywhere, or I can't anyway, in the Gospels, where it seems like Jesus gives any kind of prohibition against a Christian owning private property. And I, I don't see anywhere where the disciples uh, reach any conclusion like that, that it's incorrect or improper to own uh, private property. Um, in fact, if you, you, know, you get into the, to the book of Acts and you find that um, even in chapter 2, we find that Christians the Jesus followers owned their homes. Like if they didn't, how would they meet together in homes to break bread and to worship and to fellowship and, and care for one another and so on? And in fact, as you get further on in the book of Acts, um, you meet people like Paul had, had two very dear friends named Aquila and Priscilla. And uh, Paul points out that, that the church in Corinth met in the home of Priscilla and Aquila. So they, they owned their home. Paul's friend Philemon, while the church in Colossae met in the home of Philemon. At one point, Paul in his writings would say, hey, say, say hi to Nympha for me, as well as the church that meets in her house. You read through the, you know, the book of Acts, the, the Jesus followers still owned their homes. So whatever this, uh, in chapter 2, whatever the selling of possessions and goods is, whatever this thing is of sharing with anyone in need, Whatever that was about, at its foundation, 
it's not primarily about finances. It certainly has financial implications, but at its foundation, it is not first and foremost about finances. It's first and foremost about an attitude of heart and mind. And we see that in chapter four. So if you just flip over to chapter four, look at verse 32. Chapter four, verse 32, here's what we read. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Now keep your finger there in chapter four and just look back again to chapter two, verse 44. And just think about these two verses together. They're kind of um, companion verses. They, they, um, they're almost like parallel statements. Look at 244 again. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now go back to 432. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And so whatever this togetherness is that we read about in chapter two, verse 44, whatever that togetherness is like, certainly that togetherness has financial implications, but really that togetherness is best expressed in that phrase, um, one in heart and mind. They um, really, what we have here in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four is a is a call to radical generosity. And generosity begins with an attitude. Generosity is not first and foremost a financial issue. Generosity begins here, it begins in the mind, it begins with a decision. I just wanna be a generous person. I know that I won't do it perfectly, but that's the direction that I want my life to go. And so when you read, like if, you're, if you go back to chapter 4 and verse 32 and look at that verse, um, it's clear that, that these followers of Jesus still had possessions, right? The issue, as you look at that verse, the issue, though, is that no one claimed that any of these possessions was their own. Now, their possessions were theirs. It was their name on the deeds to their home. But the thing is, no one claimed that any of these possessions was their own. And so when this uh, church in Jerusalem, when they became aware of a need, well, they acted radically. They looked at their possessions, the things to which they held title deed. They looked at those possessions, not as things they claimed as their own, but they looked at them rather as um, commodities, as vehicles to be used uh, to meet the needs of others. They didn't hold their possessions tightly. They didn't claim them as their own. Nobody said, hey, I'm not responding to that need over there. You know, I worked hard all my life to get everything that I've got, and I'm not gonna sell it and give it away to somebody who hasn't worked as hard as I have. Nobody said that. Nobody said, you know, I'm not helping with that need over there because I've been responsible all of my life, every step of the way. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give up some of my stuff to help somebody who hasn't been as responsible as I have. There was none of that. In fact, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. And so we see this as a call to generosity and generosity starts with an attitude and it's an attitude that says, I don't claim any of my possessions as my own. It's an attitude of heart and mind, a posture of heart and mind that says, I know that my name is on the deed, but God owns my house. It's God, I'm the manager, God's the owner. And as the manager, my responsibility is to steward these things, to benefit the owner, to invest in such a way as to experience eternal dividends. You know, Jesus said, don't just lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Instead, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal. So generosity is first and foremost an attitude, a posture of heart and mind. It's an attitude. How's your attitude? How's 
my attitude. That was our attitude. Well, generous people are first of all generous in heart and mind. It's about attitude. But then attitude always works itself out in action. And it's in action that we see in Acts 2, the, the selling of goods to those in need and to, to sharing with others. In fact, we see that to such an extent, if you look at chapter 4 and verse 34, 4 and 34, it says there were no needy persons among them. Think of that. Like, that's an incredible statement. No needy persons among them. It doesn't mean that they were all wealthy. It just means there were no needy persons among them. Why were there no needy persons among them? Because they'd developed this attitude of heart and mind of generosity. An attitude of heart and mind. Their togetherness, their commonality, um, their koinonia in Jesus um, revealed itself in, in um, action, generous actions of meeting the needs of others and beautiful mutual care. Um, so really what we're talking about here in this Jerusalem church, I, I, I heard um, a, a veteran preacher by the name of Alistair Begg say it this way once. It was like, uh, you know, the people in the Jerusalem church would say, you know what, I've got X, Y, and Z. I'm going to sell Z because that person over there doesn't even have X. I've got X, Y, and Z. They don't have X. I'm going to sell Y so they can at least have X. They need X way more than I need Y. And so what we see in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, it's not some... Uh, form of Christian communism. This is voluntary. It's not mandatory. And what we see in chapter 2 and chapter 4 is not first and foremost uh, an economic policy. It's first and foremost about an attitude of heart and mind. It's people following Jesus saying, you know what, there's a need. I can meet that need. And then just going ahead and meeting that need to such an extent that it says there were no needy people among them. And uh, if you look at, at chapter 4, verse 34 again, um, we see that this isn't some kind of picture where, where the whole bunch of them are just selling everything they've got. That, that's not what we see here because look what it says. It says, from time to time, those who owned houses or lands sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Well, why would they bring it to the apostles' feet? Well, I think it was the apostles who were probably the most plugged in as to what the needs were. But the actions of these uh, Jesus followers in Jerusalem were voluntary. And um, from chapter 4, verse 34, we see that it was infrequent. It was from time to time. And um, their actions were very specific. They gave to very specific uh, needs in their context. They still had their homes. We've, we've said that. Their possessions were still their possessions. It's just that they didn't claim any of their possessions as their own. They were willing to, to give up those possessions to meet the needs of others. So we circle back to where we began. Because our question was, is this prescriptive? or descriptive? Is this prescriptive? Is this for me, for us, here and now? Or is what we see uh, merely descriptive of this early church in Jerusalem? Well, I think what is prescriptive here is um, the principle of radical generosity. I think that's what's prescriptive for us. What is descriptive for us is how this Jerusalem church carried out their radical generosity. I think that's descriptive of them and the way they carried it out in their first century context and, and the way that they met needs was highly contextualized to that time and to that place. So the way they did it was descriptive of them. But what is prescriptive for us is this principle of radical generosity. The principle of meeting needs in Jesus' name. The principle that God is the owner and we're the manager. The principle of being generous 
and caring for other people. The principle of seeing our possessions not as things that we claim as our own, but seeing our possessions really as commodities, as vehicles to, to, um, to invest in the kingdom work of Jesus, to see our, our possessions as being useful in seeing the kingdom of God come on earth, to seeing God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. The principle of radical generosity to such an extent that we would see no needy people among us. Well, I'm going to leave it there. I want to. I want to wrap up. Um, I want to. I want to wrap up first of all by saying to you, uh, Sobel Church, uh, SCF Online, and uh, to our in-person uh, worshipers as well. I want to say thank you for your generosity in investing in the kingdom work of Jesus through Sobel Church. Um, this this will sound very self-serving because I'm a pastor, um, but I believe that the local church ought to be the first place and the primary place that we as followers of Jesus invest our kingdom resources. This early church in Jerusalem was devoted to radical generosity, devoted to, to meeting needs in Jesus' name, and I'm so thankful for how I see that happening at Sobel Church. You may recall um, last Sunday, um, we, had a, we, we had a benevolent offering as we uh, do often on the first Sunday of the month in association with communion. And that's when we kind of highlight the benevolent fund. And so last Sunday, we said that our benevolent offering would be used in its entirety to help the chapel family uh, in, in light of Kim's surgery. And Kim leaves today, October uh, 10th, for um, to head off to Germany for this surgery. So please pray for this uh, family and pray for Kim. Uh, but we said that the entirety of our benevolent offering would go to help the, the chapel family with some of these expenses. And um, our board also said that they would uh, match funds up to a, a particular amount. And I'm very pleased to report today that between what came in through our benevolent offering. And when, when you add in what the, the board added to that amount, uh, we were able to come alongside the chapel family uh, with in excess of $11,000 to help with the needs. And that's beautiful. I was so thrilled when I found that out because it's just such a beautiful expression of love for this beautiful family. And let me give you some good news. Um, this, will, this might sound like bad news, but I think it's actually good news. Right now, our benevolent fund is broke. In fact, in a very few days, because of needs that we've committed to helping with, we'll be in the hole by about $2,200. And you say, well, how is that possibly good? Well, I guess it's not so good that it's going to be in the hole, but I think it's a good thing when our benevolent fund is just always touching zero and being replenished and touching zero and being replenished. I think that's way better than having some big uh, pot of money sitting in an account somewhere, not doing anybody a bit of good. I think it's good. I think it's good news in the sense that it means we're getting better at identifying needs and, and being able to, to um, take action more quickly to meet needs in Jesus' name. It's awesome. It's an incredible privilege to be able to participate uh, in this. And your generous gifts to our benevolent fund, literally, it's literally changing the world. And uh, so way to go. Let's do it more. And yes, we've got to replenish our benevolent fund because there's more needs to meet. We're becoming more and more aware of needs that we can meet um, in Jesus' name with generous gifts. And you know, the needs increase the nearer we get to winter. Um, and so yes, we, I would encourage you to, to uh, continually give to our benevolent fund, knowing that that money is gonna be dispersed to meet needs in generous uh, fashion in Jesus' name. And um, one thing you might not know, uh, that you can actually give to our Benevolent Fund anytime. You don't have to wait till the first Sunday of the month. You don't have to wait for a communion Sunday to give to our Benevolent Fund. You can do that at any time, and I would encourage you to do that. One thing you might not know 
is that as our um, benevolent fund is replenished, when it hits $8,000, anything over $8,000 automatically rolls into an account that we call our Good Works Fund. And the, the Good Works Fund um, is a little, it, it still addresses needs in Jesus' name, but it's a little bit more in an out of the box way. This might be um, coming alongside community projects or addressing community needs in, in such a way as to say to an entire community, hey, we're for you, we love you, Sobel Church is with you, uh, we're community partners together. A little more out of the box. Like for instance, it was from our Good Works Fund that a couple of months ago, we were able to fund a literally a life-saving surgery for a man in Haiti. That's our Good Works Fund. And so anything um, over $8,000 that comes into our benevolent fund automatically rolls into this Good Works Fund. And so you know what? We're committed to just as, as quickly and as generously in partnership with Jesus as he leads us to meeting needs uh, in his name. And um, it's, it's beautiful. I think as of today, our Good Works Fund is down to about $1,300. Um, so let's together uh, replenish these. Let's load up these accounts and let's like this revolutionary Jerusalem church, let's exhibit radical generosity in Jesus' name. Well, I wanna leave you with a little benediction. It comes from Hebrews chapter 13, just a couple of verses that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use this almost like you would a benediction. And uh, the, the first verse that I'll read talks about um, offering to God a sacrifice of prayer, uh, of praise rather. Um, and then the next verse, it, it reminds me of, it's kind of parental almost. It's like, like if you're parents and you're sending your kids off to school, you, just before they go out the door, you might say, oh, don't forget to bring your uh, snow pants home or don't forget to hand in that um, permission slip or whatever. There's a, there's a bit of a, oh, by the way, don't, re, don't forget to uh, in this, Next verse, it sounds a little bit parental, but here's what it is. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good. And to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. In other words, what does a sacrifice of praise look like? Well, it looks like doing good and sharing with others because that pleases God. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We live in such a beautiful country with so much to be thankful for. I hope that today you're taking some time to thank the Lord for how good he's been in your life. Why not even think of some way that you can share that blessing with someone else, to be generous, not only with your finances, but with your heart and your mind. As we leave today, I wanna to read a prayer for you from Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 and 21, which says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, we'd love to hear from you. If you go to prayer.salvalchurch.ca, you can let us know how we can partner with you in prayer. Well, that's all for today, but thanks again for joining us, and we hope that you'll be back with us next week. God bless.